first talk about Stack OS, you know, give a brief about myself. Um, and then I think, you know, give experience of my Harvard experience and then EDC and uh, how that experience of starting EDC was and what really led, how did it actually affect my life. So hopefully I'll do some justice to it, but I will start with talking about Stack OS a little bit and then maybe we can, you know, maybe also give an idea of what Web3 stands for, the philosophies behind it, and then um, how you can take inspiration from that to really make this thing successful uh, for your own careers and whatnot. Um, but while this is happening, I'll just wait for the session to start. How many people are having some ideas which they're working on as a startup? Are uh, some people shy? I think some people are like just halfway through. You know, uh, one thing which I've learned in the business school is that um, the best organizations or the most popular organizations are the ones which have founders as a face of the product. So founders who are really, really open about talking about it, uh, showing their faces and not hesitant with their half hands there, right? You must be completely there or down, it doesn't matter. Right? I think it's important that you really showcase and uh, show the excitement what you have towards your product. Um, and if you don't have that, you know, find a co-founder who can do that. Again, let me ask this question again. How many of you have some ideas and they want to really work on the startup of their own? Okay, so about 5%. Okay, good. I'm probably going to finish my bottle of water while you guys are fixing this. <laughs> How many of you guys know me by any means or heard of me? <laughs> okay, that's, that's a decent number, more than I thought. I hope good things, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Was there a question? Um, yeah, I can do that actually. Good, good point. So the question is that you know, uh, a gentleman is a is a first year student, and he's looking for um, you know some some ideas how he can get into Web three uh, and start his own organization. Um, so one thing is key, right? Learning is extremely important. And uh, find a key source of inspiration to really start the learning journey. The moment you have that, you will be able to find, you know, profound ideas. Um, second thing would be that, you know, be around people who have some knowledge of that domain. And uh, you can reach out to me, right? You can reach out to many other people, you know, who are in this space. They're very, very welcoming. Um, super excited to work. There are events which happen across Pune almost every week, right? Attend them, you know, talk about, you know, different ex what ideas you have, learn from other people's ideas. Um, I think that's where it really, really starts, right? I think just talking, being in the right circle, um, this is something, you know, very commonly used phrase, you know, birds of the same feather flock together. Um, and sometimes you need to, even if you're not the same color, you, you know, intentionally force yourself in that, uh, in that group or the community and you learn from it. And that's potentially what I would do, you know, if I was you. Um, Sir, and I had one more question. Yes. So, as we know that uh, the, the like, groups uh, we have now, those make use of our database, right? The way we are searching, etc., etc., and they make, they print their money, right? So, uh, don't you think they will keep uh, trying, they are trying to give resistance in what you are uh, trying to make as uh, you are trying to do something which, uh, which you know, like you want to use our database to give us feed or something, right? To show us the feed we are interested in. I don't think I understand the question quite much. Could so you like, repeat that, please? Uh, 
अभी जो ग्रुप से जो कुछ कुछ देखो सो फिर अभी अगर सम समझो मैंने फरारी सर्च किया तो फिर वो मुझे एड्स वगैरह में सब कुछ वही दिखाते अगर मैंने लोन्स का कुछ सर्च किया तो फिर वो सब हाउसिंग लोन्स ये वो वही दिखाते हैं राइट सो अगर मैंने अभी वेब थ्री पे चालू किया सो यू आर सेंग दैट द इट इज डिसेंट्रलाइज राइट सो इट वॉन्ट यूज माई डाटा बेस so it it is not using my database so then uh, don't you think that uh, they are trying they will try to put some friction or resistance uh, in your uh, web 3 so if i understand the question correctly and i'm going to paraphrase what you just said and let me know if i's the right thing when you say groups you mean uh, websites companies yes yes okay so so the question i think what you're asking is that if there's an organiz uh, if you let's say search for housing loans on google Google will automatically find data which is relevant to you and show you that kind of content, uh, and you are saying that is that is not there on Web3, so it might uh, be difficult to for adoption to happen. No, I was trying to ask that uh, won't they try to because bec from this uh, means generally they are selling the database right data, to yeah. other uh, websites etc. so then they are printing their money right so then yeah. uh, won't they try to uh, stop you from uh, making ah. web3 right yes uh, so are you saying that it's a competition to the existing businesses so uh, isn't that a problem uh, yes it is a problem and i think this is the fun fact right uh, open ai chat gpt uh, was something which people were kind of uh, not even expecting it to be so big it is not is challenging google is challenging you know facebook is challenging so many different organizations and if you look at it every time a new technology comes nobody likes it before uh, facebook came orkut was very popular and orkut was a google product or acquired by google but you, nobody google, uh, orkut was shut down right and uh, then they started uh, google plus i think it was called uh, and that also got shut down and um, that is kind of the way it works so i wouldn't be scared of competition competition is great it helps people innovate um so all you have to do is create a better business model make it easier to use user experience wise and i think you'll be successful thank you okay, can you pull i think if you can swipe or does that answer your question okay Can you open the presentation directly, oh, not as a file, but as a, no, not as a browser, but as a file? Sorry. Yeah, PDF. Open the PDF. Don't open on the browser. Open as a PDF. Yeah, perfect. <coughs> All right. So I'm going to start. Okay, so um, what I will do is talk a little bit about Stack OS. You know what, uh, what you know I kind of started, and then maybe also at the end of this share the journey of where we are now and how it happened to be, you know, as it is. Um, so as an example, like Stack OS was fundamentally a strategically idea was, how do you move Web two organizations into Web three? And I think this presentation is going to revolve around that and maybe give some idea about uh, what decentralization even means philosophically and infrastructure wise. Yeah, next one, please. Technical issues, right? So while this is happening, maybe I'll take another question from the from the group. Yes. Can't hear you. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are. So my question is, how you, we are talking about Web 3.0, okay, multiverse. Yes. How this Web 3.0 or multiverse uh, will affect the gig economy as well as the MSME sector? MSME sector is micro, small, and medium enterprises, uh -huh. and gig economy is uh, small employment like people, uh, like yes, Zomato delivery boy. You know, the people which get income uh, paid and their job is over. 
So uh, I think uh, the Web3 domain has got a lot to offer in terms of really decentralization of everything. That means as a creator, you can uh, small in individuals who are trying to just start up into the system, they might use the, the Web3 space as a content creator and we monetize it in a much, much more efficient manner. Right? Uh, I think some of the previous panel kind of talked a lot about how you can kind of leverage all that. Right? Um, for the medium industry, again, I think if you look at all the larger organizations, they are all trying to dip their feet into uh, Web3. Like Twitter is doing an, exam, you know, an excellent job at that. So if these larger organizations can leverage blockchain, can, can leverage decentralization, I think anyone in the world should also be able to do it. So, but, uh, uh, but sir, will they accept this technology? Yeah. It's, it's a matter of time, right? It's, it's a question which was asked um, during the internet, right? Uh, when it was just beginning. Talk about emails. People ask the same question. Will emails be used even because postals are so effective and you can hold it, you can feel it and all that stuff. Right? I think all that is, it doesn't matter anymore. So I think it's just a matter of time as people get more used to that idea, it automatically grows into something really beautiful. Okay, so thank you, sir. Yeah. Behind the white line. All right, sounds good. Only behind the white line, they said. Um, as a background, right, again, um, I am a mechanical engineer from, uh, from VIIT, uh, so way back, you know, but uh, you know, I'm also um, a co-founder of uh, EDC, uh, which you guys have heard of. And uh, in fact, it was during our time, you know, when Visual Premier was first uh, launched. So I'm really, really proud of the way the, you know, things have grown so much over the years. And uh, I think it's doing an excellent job at what it is doing. Um, quick background about me is that, you know, I have, uh, you know, after finishing my engineering, I went to US, uh, you know, I've got my two master's degree, one in, one in international business, a second one is in finance. The one from finance is from Harvard University. Um, and, uh, you know, gave me a lot of insights to really to move you know, from, um, from um, engineering to, to management. But also, I think, as part of the EDC's motive, right, I think uh, because of EDC, my, you know, my uh, experience there, it really led me to really uh, get into finance and, and, you know, business management in general. Um, for, for the ones who have known me a little bit, um, uh, I was supposed to be a very good engineer as well. And uh, you know, I built India's first cryogenic engine. It was used at TIFR and Baba Atomic Research Center. And uh, you know, I have a patent, uh, patent in, uh, on that, uh, in that domain. Um, and then yet I was, you know, moved to, or I, I chose to move to management. Um, and that was because of EDC, my, my, my interest there and my uh, fundamentally changed the way I think about uh, you know, businesses and how it should have been done. Um, and I think that's kind of pivotal. I think when you experience something like this or participate in something like uh, EDC and things like that, it will really, really help you to do the acumen to really understand people, understand emotions, and then react, learn from it, and hopefully even transition into uh, you know, creating your own businesses, right? Again, um, when, when I talked about you know, EDC, form, formulating EDC, um, we have, I have been building softwares or tools and uh, or companies even since then, right? Since I was an engineer um, and I was doing engineering in, in Vishwakarma. And um, that is, I think, interesting because people think it just like, you know, you, you do it once and you're successful. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, you know, it took me about 10 years to be where I am right now. Uh, and, you know, the product which we have been working on has been tweaked over several years pivoted and we are what we are right now, like decentralized, you know, um, infrastructure protocol or decentralized cloud. So, you know, I will get to the most details of, you know, what my career went like, but let me start with, what, you know, um, about, about the product, I think, which we have built out and what, what was the thought process behind Web3 and why I think is the next revolution one must uh, take advantage of. Next slide, please. So let me give a current uh, you know, cloud landscape. Um, of this. So, uh, people who have known Uniswap, how many people know Uniswap in the Web3 space? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing like, I, again, my visibility is not that much, but about, I think 5%, 10% of people know Uniswap, right? I, I would have expected much more number of hands up there because uh, Uniswap is a decentralized exchange. Everyone who makes money by trading and whatever, it happens on DEX, like uh, DEX is a decentralized exchange like Uniswap. 
And um, here's a beauty, right? Decentralized exchange means that anyone can list their tokens, their products, and then it can be an open market, right? Um, but what, what was really funny was that Uniswap, uh, about one and a half year back, Uniswap delisted all the tokens or the, secu or the security tokens from the website. That means, uh, how, no, I mean, think of it this way, a decentralized exchange, that means anyone can deploy uh, or can list the, list the tokens, now is controlled by central entity can decide to remove it. So ethically speaking, if you're decentralized, it is governed by the community, how can an organization individually decide to remove tokens um, from or listed tokens? So that's the difference between like you know, how governments can kind of enforce it because under the US laws, under the SEC, uh, you know, SEC stands for the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, in the US. And so they are like, okay, all the tokens which are there are uh, all these tokens which are there are part of securities laws. They fall under the securities laws. So they said, you know, remove those tokens and they had no other choice. Uniswap didn't have any choice but to delist them. Um, so that's kind of an issue, you know, when you are trying to uh, really encourage people to use decentralized exchanges, uh, trying to really provide freedom of um, economies and, and stuff. So that's, I think, important what we, what we should be doing or protecting this freedom of, um, you know, of, of uh, economy. Next one, please. The second example is I would give is, is Parler. How many of you guys have heard of Parler? No one? I just can't see. Maybe there's some hands there. Um, but uh, how many of you guys know Donald Trump? Oh, good. Yeah, that guy is good, right? Um, so Donald Trump, uh, if you're aware, he was removed from Twitter, right? Are you guys aware of that? Right, perfect. So when he was removed out of Twitter, all the followers of uh, Donald Trump, they went to this application called Parla. And the moment that started to happen, people started to, again, the governments got little, uh, felt started to feel uneasy, and they decided to completely, you know, or force these organizations to stop Parla. That means Parla was removed from the Apple App Store. AWS, uh, which is the Amazon Web Services, uh, stopped the servers on which Parla was running. So that is a big issue which it comes to these centralized you know, entities um, you know, and if governments or whoever, right, who are, in, uh, who are uh, contributing to the systems, they, are, they can unilaterally decide to stop applications. And that is the end of the power issue which we, which we have. And you know, it basically stops the freedom of speech. And if you look at this thing fundamentally, right, psychologically even, um, Stack OS is in the mission of protecting these freedom you know, of economies, of speech, and you name it, right? Any freedom thing goes on. Uh, I think Stack OS is on the forefront of that. So uh, that's kind of why it's important. When something like this happens, you see, start to see the value of uh, decentralized platforms, right? Next one, please. So what are the problems with Web2? Let's start with that specific detail, right? And I think the, the, the one of the panels also talked about these things. So the incentive mechanisms are not aligned. That means all the stakeholders, uh, all the shareholders of the of let's say Facebook, Amazon, they basically be uh, they are incentivized, you know, and not the users, right? So that's kind of a problem when you look at this. How do you create an economy where the users of the platform get incentivized for deploying apps? That is where I think where Web2 comes in, right? Second example would be you know um, when you look at Web2, that means building us something like Facebook. It's extremely difficult. It's also time consuming, and most of the times these platforms get hacked because you know, DevOps engineers make some mistakes, it's a human error, and a lot of these secret credentials are kind of lost. And, and how do you kind of protect all those things? Uh, you know, as, uh, uh, there's an issue with Web2. Nobody, we haven't found a solution to that yet. Um, there's no anonymity. That means if someone deploys an app, on the Web2 environment, you have to give your grandfather's details, right? Like, you know, if you're Facebook, or if you are, let's say, building a software on AWS, you have to give your grandfather's details, your bank account details, and whatnot to these providers, and then they will kind of allow you to use the platform. So there's no anonymity. You have to basically share everything you have or you know. Um, and the third thing, I think the fourth thing is that it cannot be controlled by DAOs. DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations. That means that individuals who are, um, you know, you can't govern an application uh, autonomously. It is still reliant on you know, whatever Amazon Web Services decides to do. Right? So that are the issues which we have in Web2. And knowing these issues, can we really say it's decentralized, right? And next slide, please. 
So, so this is the reason why true decentralization really matters. And you know, I think as entrepreneurs, we must find that balance of you know, what we can provide as a solution which is going to solve these problems which we have. So let's take an example of decentralizing Facebook and why, you know, how we can do this thing. And just keep going on until everything is covered. So um, just talking in general, like, you know, while this is going on, um, when you want to build something like Facebook, and, and, you know, you will require a few things. One is the, the front end layer, the user experience layer. Then you require something like a storage S3, you know, a file system, um, and there are databases for storing the data, right? And this is a traditional world. Again, for machine learning uh, you know, and reporting, so how does Facebook understand who could you be your potential friends, you know, um, what events you can, lead, you can get to and stuff. So all that machine learning algorithm needs to be there, right? And then when you look at messaging, like somebody messages you, how do you get the message and transcode that to, to know what has to be done on those messages? And then, you know, we also require uh, external source of data. That means how does data from real world come in, into uh, this, uh, you know, Web2 world, right? So let's even convert this into the Web3 space, and let's talk about toolings which are available already. So we have IPFS and Ethereum. Uh, you know, have you heard of IPFS, Ethereum? Okay, so there's a good, decent percentage of people knowing that. Right? So that is something which is extremely important for, uh, for data storage, uh, somebody says, as a decentralized uh, database, right? So you can use these uh, profiles as that. You can use IPFS as a decentralized storage. So you can have your photographs saved on a decentralized network, right? You don't have to rely on central entity like AWS or anybody else. Um, Chainlink is another example. Have you heard of Chainlink? Okay, so Chainlink again is one of the uh, one of the biggest Oracle providers, and Oracle is the service which brings data from real world into the blockchain. So blockchain again, as, a, you know, as we have said earlier, is a database of information, and how do you get data from the real world into the blockchain space is done by Chainlink, right? So if you look at this thing, the only data storage layer and the and the data sources, right? Are those two are the only things which are available. Every other organization which is deploying apps in Web3 are using AWS to solve the problems of presentation layer, AI analytics, integrations, and there are many, many more, right? But I'm just, for, the, for the sake of the space, I kind of just you know, narrowed it to this point. But that is the real issue of current status of Web3, right? And uh, if you're using AWS, do you think it's truly really decentralized or not? Um, the answer to this question is no, right? Because again, AWS can unilaterally decide what can be done and what, you know, whatever they want to follow, what are the rules they want to really put on there. Next one, please. So the, the main intention of Stack was to replace AWS in the technical stack, right? So when you take a look at presentation layer, AI analytics, integrations, a lot of these things can be there for true Web3 product and protocol, right? And that's kind of the envision, what we envision to do. Um, and how do we really do this thing, right? So, or what are the problems we solve? So one thing is like DevOps cost. So the DevOps is, do you know what DevOps is, guys? How many people know what DevOps means? Okay, so about 5-10%, I think. You know, that's a very low number than what I expected. So DevOps is basically an engineering domain which uh, manages infrastructure for all the applications, right? So they're deploying to uh, the cloud services. Somebody has to architect the cloud environment, create the servers, create load balancers, create traffic distribution patterns there, identify you know, who's logging in from where, authentication, all, that's, all that thing which goes around it is basically part of um, DevOps engineering. And that is, again, as I said, it's extremely difficult to do, and people make massive mistakes here, right? Um, you know, in the US, I used to manage uh, a lot of these teams, um, and, uh, you know, I would, I would pay about five to six million dollars just for individuals' salaries, right? And, and that's a big amount of capital for a small to medium scale organization. Um, so environment preparation, you know, to get deployed on AWS, it takes about seven weeks' time to build infrastructure and everything. And uh, the stack was basically cuts down the deployment time to less than 30 seconds, right? So um, no ability to pay with crypto. Uh, so we can use cryptocurrencies to pay for the compute and not having to rely on credit card, debit cards, and whatnot, right? Uh, so that means you don't have to give your grandfather's details, right? And uh, I think the final thing is, uh, I think you missed the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, governance, right? So applications deployed on Stackverse can be governed by the community. It can't be on, on an AWS account of a customer, right? Like, like Uniswap's uh, AWS account was under the, under the founder's account, and obviously which got, uh, you know, which was forced to kind of remove the security tokens. So that's kind of the problems which we have. That's what Stackverse does to solve those problems. 
Right. And it's, it's super simple to use. First thing is that you dockerize an app. You know Docker? How many people know Docker? Oh, thank God. Better than the other numbers. So, you know, so the Docker, if you don't know Docker, guys, you must learn that if you're in IT and whatnot. Um, Docker, I think, is going to be the next uh, evolution of how programming is done. In fact, all the services which are deployed on AWS, GCP, Azure, all the big cloud providers, even the largest organizations, they all use Docker as their framework for deployments. So it's, it's a skill which all of us must attain if you don't have. It's very simple to do as well. So just get that knowledge there. Uh, so Docker is your application. Once you do that, you can reserve compute on AW, uh, on Stack OS. Uh, it's a UI, you can make quick changes, and you, know, you can reserve compute. And then whatever command you will run locally to run an application, a Docker command you run to, on, the, on the local machine, the same can be transformed onto the UI. And you click the deploy button, and within 10 seconds or less, the application will be running. So that is kind of the power of Stack OS. I would really encourage you to see some of the videos on YouTube, uh, which showcase that thing. I don't have time for the, the, in this time. Uh, I don't have enough time to showcase that, but it'll be something of real value to really learn what Stack OS does. Right. Um, so I think that will be pretty much. So you know, Stack OS is the, is the category leader in dCloud, and. Um, you know, we are the world's most utilized and the fastest growing decentralized cloud. And when I say that, let me show some numbers. As of today morning, we have had about 104 million websites served over the network, right? And that's a big number from, you know, enormous scale, which we've achieved. Uh, we have 3,700 uh, concurrent applications running and over 16,000, 16, uh, 1650 products deployed on Stack OS. So again, that is a great number, and I think the, the biggest reason why we have this kind of adoption is because of user experience. And again, I would highly encourage you to just look at the YouTube videos and stuff, um, you know, which we have for the demo. So version two is, uh, is coming for Stack OS, which is gonna be literally game, you know, game changing. So whoever is interested, you know, please reach out to us uh, through, you know, to, through different mediums. We are on social media as well. Uh, you can take my phone number from the, from the organizers and can contact me there as well. Happy to, you know, work with you guys, help you wherever I possible. I think as, as a motive which I had to work on this lease is to support as many founders, entrepreneurs to really excel in a, in a, in a great way. And um, yeah, whenever I can help, I'll be happy to do that. Just reach out. The, the one thing is, is the hardest probably, but people think is the hardest to reach out to people. Uh, but again, this entire ecosystem is so new, so small, that uh, you know, all of us are extremely, extremely helpful to really um, support founders to start organizations. So the thing what you should really do is reach out and ask for help, and people will be happy to help you there. Yeah? Um, Ambassador program, uh, that doesn't matter, I guess. You can reach out to me or you can fill out the form. Um, the next one, okay, follow us. Uh, this is supposed to be some other presentation, so ignore that. Um, so now let me get to the other port of, uh, portion of the, you know, what I was supposed to be here for, is uh, talk about EDC, talk about my journey, you know, why, why something happened in my life, which it did. Uh, I think I talked about a you know, little bit of my, I was a great, I was, you know, I didn't get good marks in my exams, right? So don't take that as, uh, I, I would actually say this, right? I think in the University of Pune, right? It's, it was very strict in terms of what questions they asked. It had to be exact, you know, um, answers as in the textbooks. If you could do that, you'd get the grades and you were through, right? And I was extremely bad at that. My, uh, I can see a lot of my professors, you know, who taught me as well and, you know, saying, nodding to that. I'm, I'm sure it's much different with auton being autonomous now. But uh, that was a sincere problem which we had. So we could not explore the things. We couldn't explore, we didn't have internship programs to really work with other organizations and whatnot. So, you know, we had to, and in fact, if you took the assignment model, uh, it was funny because, you know, the way assignments worked, I don't know how it works now, and maybe you can tell me, is that back in the days, uh, there was one guy, sincere guy, who would do the assignment, and then that will be passed on to somebody else, and there will be two copies of the same assignment. That will become four, eight, 16, 32, and it's a, like a nuclear reaction, right? It's, you have so many copies, and everybody has the exact same answer. Is it the same right now? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh, these are the experiences, I think, which teach you how this can get better with time. And um, so when I went to the, uh, you know, like I started EDC, you know, um, again, uh, participated in different events, learned a lot from uh, really doing things on, on the field. Uh, I built India's cryogenic engine, um, you, know, you know, again, there were some issues and I couldn't really pursue it as part of my B project, but it was sponsored by TIFR, uh, 
TIFR is Tata Institute of, Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. Um, and then, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, so I kind of had a patent and everything. So it was really, really good experience there. A lot of the professors who taught me were pretty surprised we got it working. And, uh, and that was the engineering portion of my life, right? But then you come to this ADC experience, which really helped me understand markets, understand people, and really groomed my interest towards business. I wanted to be a scientist, right? But it's, it's not happening. In, in, I don't think it's going to happen now. We're too late for that. Uh, but, you know, it transformed me to become an entrepreneur, startup, and go to management, and then figure out what I could do better. Um, and I've been building startups, like, since then. None of them have been successful, right? Except Stack OS. So, uh, and the thing is, when I see that, I see it with a grain of salt. Because when you start organizations, people forget that uh, it's not about what you are going to make. It's about a journey. And it's, it's a cliche, I understand that. But think of it this way. You build a product, right? You think it's going to work. You do some market research and whatnot. The real success happens when you hear, listen to the feedback of people, right? Um, and again, when I when apply to all the business schools in the US and stuff, um, the biggest advantage which I had, of course, was you know, the patent. People don't usually have a patent in, in, while they're engineering, doing the engineering. But apart from that, it was also about you know, I have organized events, participated in creating these uh, organizations, starting my own company, which did not succeed, but at least I had worked towards it, so I knew what does not work, right? And then most of the people understand. So that was kind of a very, very easy, you know, f for me to get into that kind of domain. So I would encourage anyone to really participate in different EDC events, see if you can start your own company. It's okay to fail. This is the right age to take risks, you know, because you can, and, and explore yourself, right? So. Um, so when I went to US, I learned all these good things, you know, and of how education works there, and it is dramatically different from what it is in India. And uh, as part of that experience, right, so I was there and I learned, uh, we had this program in finance uh, from Harvard. There they had this small uh, pro, uh, a tool which they had, so you can basically give, you have like 100 questions or something, and then you have to answer them as fast as possible. And uh, so we kind of build that kind of product, a learning management system. And I think, you know, back in the days, some of you guys, no, actually not, some of you alumni, I think, would have used the product of ours, also RK in mind back in the days. You know, and I, I came there a few times to see if there's any traction. Um, but again, there was a lot of issues, for, you know, for, for adoption and stuff. Um, and that was across the world. It's not just here, but it was across the globe, right? So we had a little difficulty in adoption. So, um, so that's when we listen to the market. Okay, market is saying that you know you have bigger competition like Canvas, Blackboard. Uh, have you heard of those tools? Are you using that now? Okay, so these were the products which were there in the US, right? And so we went, what I did was try to create a product for you know, for India and everything else. So we had, we had an amazing product, better than Canvas and Blackboard even now, right? But again, adoption is is quite difficult because there's a lot of uh, you know capital needs and uh, you know how people actually perceive products to be. So uh, it didn't really work. But what we got is feedback from people, right? And um, even while I was doing my startup, again, I was bootstrapped. I was working for my full-time job in the US. Uh, for almost 10 to 12 years, I was in the US. And uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes? OK. So uh, you know, when you start a journey like this, you try to you, you learn that um, feedback and using that feedback in a constructive way is extremely hard. Right, I, I had my, uh, you know, this experience of, uh, then I decided to use, I uh, made a decent learning management system of the learning management system. That means that today's scholarships were given, or back in the days at least, scholarships were given to the top three, top four people, right? And um, that was kind of a problem because the rest of the, the usually the class, the children in the class, they know that they'll, they'll never get, uh, you know, uh, scholarships. They won't even work hard for it. So, so what we did was we adopted the first blockchain part of this, which was a decentralized reward system. That means that anyone who gets 80% or more on, the, on those internal exams, um, they, could be they would be incentivized with some eth Ethereum and some tokens and stuff. So that was the first model which we adopted. And that had a pretty good success. So we were used uh, you know, by almost 100,000 users across the world. We had about um, some government agencies in the US using us. There were some you know, organizations in Bangladesh using us, Europe, uh, US universities and stuff. Except, everything except India. It was uh, in a difficult market to crack. Um, but that was the kind of how we you know, got there. But then during that journey, it was making us money. 
we were we were not extremely you know uh, profitable. We were just making it through. At least I didn't have to pay for my pocket anymore, right? Uh, so that was a good thing. But then the real journey started off. It was one of our advisors said that hey, I, I was like, okay, let me just decentralize everything, not just the smart contracts, but the infrastructure layer for stack uh, for Integro. Um, and then when we did that, our advisor was like, hey man, this is an excellent product. You may want to see if there's a real viability in the market for this you know, decentralized compute. And um, so, so sure enough, uh, shortly, uh, everyone said, that, okay, this is an excellent product which you have. Make this your main product. So if you look at the journey, right, we had an initial product, it, we tweaked it to make it a decentralized reward system, and then we pivoted completely to a side project of ours, right? Again, it's a user feedback which we got and which led us to do. And all of that kind of transcends into the mindset, right, which was ingrained while I was in EDC, and also, you know, basically blossomed while I was in different business schools, a lot of experiences in doing things wrong until I got it right. Right and now, I think Starkos is doing fantastically well. We are positioned really well for version two, and um, they're doing really, really good job at that. So I would highly encourage people to take this as as a, as a message of how you could really start your organizations, make it really worth of value uh, for people to use. And uh, remember one thing, right? Persistence is the key. There are going to be extremely hard times. Uh, you know, um, you'll get married, you'll have children, you'll have to take care of all that while ensuring that you continue your spirit of building. Um, you know, your own product, your own organization. And there'll be times when you just stop working towards it, and that is okay, right? Because guess what? You will wake up the third, fourth day, and you're like, you know what? Let me just do this thing, and let me see what happens, right? And that is a passion which you automatically build as you see smaller successes, and that transcends into the long-term success of your product. Um, you know, I, I, I would take that message. You know, and extremely important to be um, a good human beings. If you can't be that, you know, essentially, it'll end up in the wrong way. So, you know, try to build something of value, trust that, you know, ideas are going to work, and keep working towards it, and just be good human beings, and that'll take you a long way, yeah? All right, thank you, guys. Thank you very much.